elements of an animated cartoon, right? Um, you kind of do all the cinematography and the acting, you draw it all. It's like kind of comic book panels in sequence. Um, and you put it all together to give a really good idea of how the story is playing. And actually that's gonna be a lot of my talk today is that storytelling is uh, communication, okay? That is sort of the most important thing. So I have a small example today from a couple examples. The first thing I'm gonna show you is from uh, Mickey Mouse cartoons. Uh, it's a storyboard by Aaron Springer, who is a huge hero of mine, very funny guy. Um, and I'll only show you a little bit because I don't want to show the, the full clip and we've got limited time. So let me just try to set this thing up. Let's see, let's see. VLC, VLC, VLC. All right. Okay, let me make sure to share screen on Zoom really quick. Where is Zoom? Right here. Right here. Share screen. Sound. I'm going to do optimize. Okay, let's watch a little bit. And you'll see exactly what uh, storyboarding is. Oh, I don't hear any. This sure is a great way to see the city, isn't it, Mickey? It sure is. And I'm going to make sure you get to see the whole thing. Really? You betcha! Next stop, Chinatown, everybody. This sure is a great way to see the city, isn't it, Mickey? It sure is. And I'm gonna make sure you get to see the whole thing. Really? You betcha! Next stop, Chinatown, everybody. Chinatown, or as they like to call it around these parts, Chinatown. What do you say we hop off here and get some dim sum? Dim sum? I love some. Um, so as you can see from this clip, basically storyboarding is we are laying out the entire scene. You know what I mean? We are timing the jokes. We're doing all this stuff. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. It's a beautiful story. Um, but that was my job at, at Disney um, for years. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, I also wanted to be a character designer when I was in school, uh, but I pivoted to storyboarding later uh, near graduation. And I think that's something important too that I want to leave you with is that in your career, in your life, 
Um, it's good to be flexible. It's good to be okay with pivoting, you know what I mean? Like, I always dreamed of doing character design specifically, but uh, when I got into school, it turned out I really loved storyboarding, which is, which is what this is. I love communicating a story. I love making people laugh. I love making them cry. I love making them feel all these big emotions, and a lot of that was coming through the storyboarding work. And so now I want to show you a side of these storyboards from Amphibia and the finished product, and you'll see how close the uh, storyboard resembles the final result. In this clip, too, the story is that um, Anne has put on a, a, a Christmas parade for her parents, um, something they've always wanted, and the bad guy, King Andreas, he hijacks this Santa balloon and it goes after them and it tries to kill them. Um, and I picked this clip, too, because uh, Float design, which is Thai inspired, you can see there's a little bit of a, a on the front of it. Um, and that's another thing too, is that I love putting Thai culture in this show, in Amphibia, because I think in storytelling, it's best to be genuine. If you're genuine and you're drawing from your, your own life, it, it's going to feel really good to an audience member. It's going to feel like a, a true story. And that's, that's all people really want when they're watching something. They want genuine emotions. They want to know, you know, sort of the truth of your story. Um, and so for me, I think it's always a great idea to, to pull stories from your life. You know what I mean? Like, you can absolutely just make stuff up. Like, you know, I watch a movie like Kill Bill, and I know that the director is just having, like, a great time. But I think it's also wonderful if you're putting your personal experiences into your stories because there's a better chance that people will connect that way. So here, check this out. <laughs> Big step up from last year. We've got to get out of here now! Of a giant robot! Allie, just punch it! <laughs> Wait! You didn't even get to open your presents! Hold up, presents? Maybe we should hear this guy. Oh, it stopped when the clip ended. I see, I see. Here, let's do this. So let's just do the whole, let's just do this. Let's just do this. Yeah, yeah, because then it'll, it'll stay forever. You throw milk and cookies? I don't think that's going to work, you guys.
Buddy, is Santa gonna be okay? <laughs> no, Timmy. I don't think so. All right, awesome. So as you can see, again, storyboards on top, footage on the bottom, really similar, right? Very, very similar. So you can see that we're doing all this work to lay out the scene well before it's animated, just to make sure that the story is playing and we're happy with everything. Okay, now, I know all of you are probably wondering, so I'm a storyboard artist, right? And I'm working at Disney and I've been working there for a couple of years. How did I get into having my own show? You know what I mean? Like, how did that process happen for me? And I'll tell you, it was, it was gradual. So uh, season one of Gravity Falls, I was a board artist and I, I loved it. Um, season two of Gravity Falls, I was a director. And the showrunner made me a director, not because I was the best board artist, because I wasn't. I was like a B, B plus board artist at best, I would say. But my communication skills were quite strong. And I think that's something, don't underestimate this facet of your growth and your learning as you work. Communication is very important. And directing, you will be surprised to learn, is a communication job. It's a people job. It's about delegating work. It's about inspiring people to do their best work. It's not really about what you can do as an individual anymore, but what you can kind of draw out of a team. And that was something that I loved. I loved doing that. I loved directing. I loved collecting the work from the artist. I loved putting it together and making the best product possible. Cool, but that's directing. How did I get into show running? And this is where it gets a little bit nuanced and I hope that this inspires you, but I never wanted to have a television show. It was never my dream. I wanted to be a uh, storyboard artist uh, for movies, for Pixar, you know what I mean? For Disney, that, that's really what I wanted. I wanted to be a cog. I wanted to be the best cog. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I could never get the job at, at Pixar. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I actually applied about five times uh, and I, I never got it. And, you know, that was one of those moments in my career where I said to myself, okay, I think it's time to, to pivot. It's time to try something else. And it was so funny too, because uh, my fifth rejection, I promise you, it's, <laughs> I did not even apply. They sent like the rejection email and I didn't even apply that year. And I think it was a mistake. Like I got caught in the system and they sent it anyway. But what was so good about that to me is it was like a sign. I was like, okay, fair enough. Let's put this one down. Let's try something else. And so I got into television animation instead, really enjoyed it. Never thought I would really enjoy it, but that was so wonderful for me. Um, so I'm in television and I'm enjoying it, but I still never really wanted a television show until my boss just one night next to me says, you should pitch your own show. You know what I mean? Like you've got ideas, you should try to make them into a show. Um, and for me, uh, ooh, it's okay. That was something that I never um, considered. It's something that I, I never knew I was capable of, but I'm so glad that this, my boss uh, suggested it and had faith in me and, you know what I mean, pushed me into it. And so I, I encourage you as well, you know what I mean? You don't know what you're capable of. You don't know the thing that you love yet. It could be out there and it could be something you haven't thought of yet. Um, so please keep an open mind and be flexible in, in your career. I think it's very important. So for me, now that I have this bug in my ear, you should pitch a show. I think to myself, yeah, yeah, maybe I should because like, you know, I love creating worlds and I love creating characters. Maybe, maybe I should try. And again, you know, don't be afraid of rejection. Don't be afraid of failure because it's coming for all of us. You know what I mean? Like there are some people and they, every, every, every shot they take, they, they make it. But I think for most of us, that's, that's not true. And for me, Amphibia was the third thing that I pitched uh, to Disney. Um, and the, the other two were like total bombs. Um, but what was good about those other two pitches, the failures, uh, is that they taught me so much. You know what I mean? Like when you're pitching something to an executive or to a studio, you, it's a little bit like improv or a conversation where you're looking at their eyes and you're like, okay, where am I losing them? Where are they getting bored? Where are they not interested anymore? Oh. Uh, I was able to take those learnings and put them into my next pitch. So now I'm going to show you something that I don't think anyone's seen before, which is the original pitch book for Amphibia. And so this is what I brought to Disney. Uh, a pitch book or a pitch deck, it's normally just about 
like 20 pages. It's not too much because nobody wants like, goosh, like a giant, you know, Bible dropped on their desk to read. That can seem like a good instinct if you're like building this world. You know what I mean? You want it to have all this lore. But trust me when I say 20 pages is, is about good. You want to kind of give the person a taste, but don't overwhelm them. So check this out. And it's quite different. It's quite different when, from what ended up on the screen. Okay, this is it. This is the original pitch Bible for the show. It was called Amphiboland back then. It was very different, but similar in many key ways. I'm gonna walk you through it just very quickly just so you can see everything. I won't, I won't go slow enough that you can read it, but I will go slow enough that you can see all the pictures. But here you can see summary. Three 13-year-old girls find themselves trapped in a medieval fantasy world populated entirely by anthropomorphic frogs, newts, toads, and salamanders. Okay, so that's what we call a log line, which is a, a summary of your entire idea and its appeal in a very short sentence. And what's good about that is any, anyone who reads that, if you're an executive, Heck, if you're an investor, you know whether you're interested in. Okay, three girls, three teenage girls stuck in a kind of Lord of the Ringsy, crunchy medieval fantasy world. I like that. And that's sort of enough. Now they're interested. Now they can read more about it. So here are some drawings. Here's Anne, the very first iteration of Anne. And you can see in this version, she was a lot more, a, a lot less put together. I really liked this idea of just, she looks like a girl dropped in a completely different world, you know what I mean? I really liked that for her. But, you know, no matter what changes the story went through, Anne, as a character, Anne Boon Choi, was always the same. And I think that's also very important for your story, is that you know what's okay to change and what's, you know, you can't compromise on. Because, like, for example, character's hat, that's okay, you can change that. It doesn't really matter. I wouldn't, I wouldn't die on that hill, like, for the hat. But for a character's core personality. Now, maybe that's something you want to fight for. So here you go. Here's Anne. Here she is. She's lazy. She loves to read magazines. She doesn't like to work. All of this stuff was communicated very early on for the characters. And then here's Sprig, early Sprig, and his name used to be Weed. We had to change that pretty quickly because obviously that sounds like cannabis and like I couldn't have Anne running through the woods yelling like Weed at the like <laughs> top of her lungs. But he used to be very cute very like frog-like, you know what I mean? He didn't have a hat. That was something we came to in development, but he was always very sweet and cute and pure. You know what I mean? That was his core character. See, there's him kind of dreaming of being something more, of going on big adventures. And again, these are very simple drawings, okay? They're, they're only here to communicate. And again, that's, that's sort of our, our job as storytellers. We're trying to communicate something. We're trying to communicate feelings. Here's a little frog just a small little guy, and he wants to be something great. You know what I mean? And you can get all that just from an image. I'm not saying it's the best drawing, because it's not. Oh, and there, here's a page on their relationship. See, he's, uh, she's uh, uh, enabling him. You know what I mean? Together, they are something more. So there's a drawing of them working together to kind of like pick some fruit. All right, I got to get, get through this a bit. Here's Hop Hop at the beginning, completely different character. He looks like he's from like Ron Mahaff or something. Here's Polly, early Polly, very simple. She used to be like very wise. That was like her whole thing because she was in this bucket and she had a lot of time to like think and to meditate. Completely changed her in the show where she was like a loose cannon, which I quite, I quite love. I think it's a great change. These are other characters, didn't even make it into the show, but they gave the reader a sense of a world that was populated a world full of interesting people that you wanted to know more about. And, you know, iterations of these characters did make it into the final show, but not like this. So, yeah, you've got these side characters. You have the other girls. You have Marcy here. She was a little bit more of a, a, a musician back then. She became like a bard in the world. That was something. Uh, and here's Sasha, right? She generally, oh, these characters kind of stay the same. You know what I mean? For all their changes, their, their essences made it this is a character didn't even show up in the show don't worry about that character didn't show up in the show quite different a uh, little bit about the world you know what i mean the idea was that um all the creatures in amphibia would be like monstrous versions of things that would eat frogs 
So like chickens, not that scary, right? But like a chicken that was 60 feet tall, that's pretty scary. So all of this stuff, you know, I'm trying to communicate to the executive or to the person that I'm pitching to. This is the appeal of the, of the show, of the series. And I'm not doing it in like, you know, a very long amount of time. It's very simple. Oh, in the beginning, Anne slept like in a little like doghouse, kind of like Snoopy, you know what I mean? Like with her, her feet sticking out the side. And I remember the exec said like, that's just too sad. And I was like, okay, <laughs> no problem. She can sleep inside the house. <laughs> a little bit on the town, a little bit on the world. There's like a map that I drew, which is funny because like this map in the original pitch Bible, we finally did produce a map of Amphibia, which I'll show you. And it, it reminds me like of all the work I did back here. Um, themes, some themes on the show about, you know, it's about change, it's about choosing who you want to be. Again, looking for those key images that tell you a lot about the characters and tell you a lot about Anne's role in this world. Look at, she's standing up for these little frogs who can't fight for themselves, um, and she's clearly out of place. Those are the kinds of feelings I always wanted to communicate with this project, you know what I mean? And these are the feelings that, despite whatever changes the show went through, made it into the final product, because I believed in them. Um, and then some sample episodes is good to have at the back. Just kind of like little ideas like, oh, in this, in this episode, Sprig and Anne get into pig racing or whatever, you know what I mean? It doesn't, it's not super important, but all of this is kind of like, it's like a little like buffet, a mini buffet of what your show will be. So if you're interested in pitching your own show, it's start with something like this, something very manageable, you know what I mean? Again, about 20 pages, the characters, the world, you know what I mean? The themes, I would say focus on those three things, but really by the first page, honestly, you'll know whether you've hooked them, you know what I mean? Like if they don't like the first page, like the kind of log line of your show, they're not gonna keep reading. So that was something I learned from Rejection, honestly, from pitching uh, shows. I pitched one that was like uh, kind of like a Power Rangers, but then like Big Hero 6 came out the next year and I was like, uh, never mind. Uh, and then I pitched one that was like kind of a Star Trek y thing and it, it had too many crazy ideas in it and there was no emotional core to grab onto. Okay, cool. So that, that was the first pitch Bible. Now let's go ahead and warp to the end of this experience, right? I've made three seasons of this show, right? Over, oh, and by the way, scariest part of this pitch book is the date. It was pitched in 2015. That was the first pitch. Think about how many years ago that was that this project got started. And now finally, years later, it's finished. So that's another thing about animation and about these creative endeavors is that they'll take a long time and you, you have to be patient, you know what I mean? You, you need to have to be a little bit uh, gracious to yourself. Like this, this is, it's a, um, we always say it's a marathon, not a sprint, you know what I mean? So a lot of it is kind of waiting for the right moments and finding a rhythm. Okay, so that's the, that's the pitch book. And now I'll run through this pretty quick so that we can have time for Q&A. All right, that was all preliminary. Here's the actual talk. <laughs> this is 10 things I learned from making Amphibia, okay? 10 things, 10 very simple things. Some of these are story oriented. Some of them are a little bit about the job of show running. So please, I hope, I hope you enjoy this. Number one, please delegate. So delegate means find someone who does a job really well and, and give it to them, you know what I mean? You will have a team of writers working for you. Let them do their job. It can be very difficult when you start a project that is so personal to you to let go and to let people do their work. But I promise you, it's totally worth it because in the first couple episodes of Amphibia, I was staying up till like 4 a.m. trying to do everything myself when I had this wonderful team who was there waiting to, to help me. So. You know, and this drawing is, you know, how it feels to be trying to do all these things at once. Really, animation is, it's about communication, it's about teamwork, it's a group effort, and you should embrace that part of it because you'll get so many good ideas that way. Number two, very similar, show running 
it's a, it's a people job, okay? So I had no idea when I started, but show running, you will get to know these team members. I had about 40 people working for me, and I knew, I knew everything about them by the end of the show. I knew when someone's kids were sick. Did someone just, I think, shout my name? <laughs> um, you knew when someone's kids were sick. You knew when someone was having a bad day. It's intrinsically tied to people, this work. And you can kind of, I know some people, they like to separate like, oh, it's just the job. You know what I mean? But it's not true. Like you, you really can't separate the people from the job they do. And so it's really important to treat people really well. You know what I mean? Like, even if you're the boss, uh, they're not, these people are not wrists and they're not tools. It's really important to treat everyone very, very kindly. And you can get into so many situations where leadership is toxic. It's very common, very common in film uh, because the, the stress is high, the stakes are high, but I promise you it is far more rewarding to be a, a kind person at the end of the day because the show is the show, but I've made so many wonderful connections and relationships with my team that they'll be there forever. You know what I mean? So number three, JRPGs. I'm a, by the way, I'm a huge nerd. Uh, I don't know if you knew that. I love video games. I love Japanese RPGs. And I have discovered in the making of this show that Japanese RPGs have a wonderful story structure. So three seasons of a television show is about 30 hours worth of programming. A Japanese RPG is also about 30 hours. And so what I discovered is that those games have this amazing way of putting story turns at just the right moments. These big, dramatic, epic moments. Like I think about Final Fantasy VII where Sephiroth, you know, stabs Aerith. And like, that was a big deal for me growing up. I could see the inherent beauty and the drama of that structure. Really good stuff. Don't underestimate video games. There's beautiful storytelling in those games. Number four. Find the North Star for your story. So this is sort of like what we were talking about before, which it's, where it's like, know what can change in your story, okay? Amphibia will always be the story of Anne Bunchui changing from a not so great person into a good person, okay? And that's really important. It was super important for me because think about stories where the hero is good and then at the end of the story, they're good. It's, it's not that interesting, you know what I mean? You want some real growth in these characters. And so for me, it was really important that for season one, and be kind of bratty, be kind of snobby, be very lazy and be irresponsible so that now you have this wonderful space to grow. And when you get to the end of the show and she's this hero, you really feel it, you know what I mean? And so I love stories like that. For me, this was very important. For you, it can be something else. I don't know, whatever your passion is, just hold it inside. Again, this is for you as a storyteller. It's not really for anyone else. Like, whatever it is, write it down for your story, pin it on the wall. And so anytime you're in a jam and you're having trouble writing, you can look at that and be like, yes, yes, this is a story about one girl's growth and self-improvement. Number five, characters. Characters are literally everything in your story. They're everything. You care about people. You don't care about MacGuffins. You don't care about the Infinity Stones. The Infinity Stones aren't people, you know what I mean? What you care about is Iron Man. What you care about is Captain America. You care about these individuals because that is real life. You make connections with people in your life and you care about them. And if you don't care about the characters in the story, you don't care about the story, I promise you. So when you're creating your own worlds and your own shows and your own stories, make sure that like, you put a lot of love and effort into these characters because really they're the engine for your entire story. Next, number six, feedback is your most valuable tool. So this, is, this can be a scary thing for any artist, any writer, showing your work to somebody else. Oh, very scary, huh? But you need to do it and you need to get comfortable with doing it because once you separate yourself from the work, it will help you improve. You know what I mean? You'll be able to realize that feedback, it's just data. It's just information that will help you create the best product possible. And so in our show in Amphibia, we have something called um, board pitches where we get together and we all watch the episode together. 
And what's wonderful about that is that afterwards, people talk about it. And that's not something to hide from. Like I could go into my office and be like, ooh, I don't wanna hear it. But it's, it's important to listen because like people are honestly giving you very useful feedback that you can incorporate into your work. So when you have a script, when you've written a story, show it to your friends, show it to your mom, show it to anyone, honestly, because again, as we've talked about, storytelling is communication. You want to share these feelings and these emotions with other people. Uh, don't hoard them to yourself. Number seven, locations can be characters too. So in our show, we had three primary locations that I desperately wanted you to get attached to. So we have Wartwood, which is very green, secure, and kind of woodsy, right? Very homey. Then we have the city of Newtopia, which is kind of like a seaside town, like Rome, you know what I mean, Venice. Um, and then lastly, we have Los Angeles, but not generic Los Angeles. We have a very specific Los Angeles because we live there. The artists who live there were able to show a true Los Angeles, you know what I mean? The Los Angeles at, at sunset, the Los Angeles with the wind blowing in the palm trees. That's the, that's the Los Angeles we wanted. And the wonderful thing about if you put this work into these locations, then when they're in danger, you know what I mean? Like if somebody's gonna like destroy Wartwood, I would like put my life down for that place. You know what I mean? Like you really care about these places. Number eight, time. Time rules all things. In a production, it's always down to time. Uh, have you guys seen Lord of the Rings, the extended edition? Like, you know, the long ones? That's a dream. You know what I mean? Like we create so much content that we can't put in the show. We just can't, it's, it's not possible. Um, so you need to make decisions about what is said, what is, what is focused on, and all of that comes down to our run times. You know what I mean? Like for me, it was, I think, 11 minutes per episode or sometimes 22 minutes, but man, I, everything I did was dictated by those restrictions. And those restrictions can be good because they can help you focus your story a little bit. Um, ooh, actually, uh, I wanted to pass, Pass this around the room. Since you know, there's so many things that we weren't able to put in the show, we, we made a book and it's just got like a ton of stuff in it. Uh, I'm gonna pass it around the room so that you guys can just look at it. But like the best part is there's like a little flip book in the corner. So please uh, flip it. <laughs> I'm gonna start with you guys. Okay. Number nine, loading the party cannon, okay? This is kind of like a storytelling concept that I picked up from working on the show. Do you guys know what a setup and a payoff is? So in a story, we call it Chekhov's gun because it's a, there's like a Star Trek episode where somebody puts a gun on the table and then you're like, it gets used later in the episode. But basically a setup and a payoff is that you seed something very early in the story and then at the very end of the movie or the story, oh my gosh, it's back. A great example is like in the movie, The Incredibles, like the capes thing, like no capes, no capes, no capes. And then at the very end of the movie, that's what ends up killing Syndrome. That's called a setup and payoff. Okay, so in Amphibia, I decided we would save all of the payoffs for one episode and that we called it loading the party cannon in the sense that like you would gather all these setups, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and you would load the cannon. And then for this season finale, you would, you would shoot it. And it just felt amazing to have not one payoff, but like six payoffs right next to each other. And it really helped the finales pop. You know what I mean? All right. Number 10, take big swings, make crazy choices and have fun. So, a lot of people said this to me when I was working on Amphibia, and I just didn't believe it. They were like, oh, you'll have another show, so don't, don't like put too much pressure on this or don't worry so much. But I was like, there's no guarantee. What are you talking about? That's not a thing. I'm not like promised another show in the future. What if this is the only show I get? In that sense, make sure to do all the things you want to do with your story. You know what I mean? There may not be another opportunity for something like this. So when you do eventually get a show or have a book published, don't don't hold back, you know what I mean? People love 
brave choices. They love big swings. A good example is I love horror movies. Horror movies is like my favorite thing. And so I made sure to put like really, really scary stuff in the show. Like this is like a, a frog made from skins of other frogs. I love it. I love that stuff. There's an episode where Polly has like a, a sleep paralysis, like a night terror. And it's this, this guy in the corner who just like turns and screams at her. I love it. It's like my favorite thing. But then also, you know, there was this complicated idea in the show that these three girls who go on this adventure together, at the very end of it all, 10 years later, they've sort of drifted apart and come back together and found each other. Very risky thing. I knew that a lot of people wouldn't like it because it's kind of a harsh truth and reality sometimes is that you drift apart from your friends. But I wanted to have this beautiful message that at the end of the day, you come back together, you know what I mean? That was something that was very important to me in my life. And so I wanted to make sure it was in the show. I wasn't content with an ending that was like, the good guys win and everybody's happy. I really wanted this beautiful textured message about friendship and it's how it changes, how it pushes, how it pulls. Um, and so I, I made sure to put it in the show. Cool. Here's some really fun stuff really quickly. So even before the pitch book, I just did this art. I was like, oh, what if it was like a girl in a frog world? So this is like one of the very first drawings I did before I even started pitching the show around, just to get myself excited, you know what I mean? And I, I highly encourage that. Draw for yourself. Whatever gets you excited, do it. If it's a crazy drawing that you, maybe you don't show anyone else, great, do it. It's all good. Oh, this is, uh, the book is coming out uh, December, in December, not November anymore, but, uh, Anyway, this is, this is the part where I would have given you the book, but this journal basically has all this information we couldn't fit in the show. It's all in this book and I'm very excited about it. And lastly, you saw that map in the original pitch book. Here's the finished map. Uh, this is a piece I, I actually, I drew this one myself and it was so gratifying to do because after you know 2015, that's so many years ago, here I am finally doing the map that was promised in that original pitch book. So that's, that's the talk. Thank you so much. I'd, I'd love to um, uh, open it up to questions now. Um, I think it's okay uh, time-wise uh, if we go a little over. I do have, it's so funny, I'm actually flying back to Los Angeles tonight. So yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I'm super happy to be here. This is exciting. So please, let's do questions. I don't know what the best format for this. Is there a mic that, is there a traveling mic? Questions, questions, anyone, anything? Yes, sir. Oh, do you, is there a... Thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask some question about character de development in the show Amphibia. Uh, first is, um, May I ask what is more difficult between writing uh, a hero like Anne or writing a villain like uh, King Andreas? And also, what is an intention behind swapping like Marcy and uh, <laughs> Sasha? Yeah, uh, swapping Marcy and Sasha like interest in uh, in the ending, like <laughs> swapping their what? So, um, like in the end. Marcy changed from STEM to writing a oh, comic yes, book, yes, right? Oh, yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So um, uh, villain is uh, easier to write, so fun. It's, especially for King Andreas, he got to just chew up the scenery. And for King Andreas, we did this thing. I've heard a lot of people call King Andreas a twist villain. He's not a twist villain because in his very first introduction, you see this dude with like an evil chessboard. I'm like, that's not a twist, okay? He's clearly evil. Um, instead, the tension was that when is it gonna happen? When is it gonna be revealed that this guy is a bad guy? And I enjoyed that a lot more because it was, you, it was dramatic irony. You knew things that the characters didn't. And I loved that for, for Andreas, that was, that was great. Um, for Marcy, I thought her ending up as an artist was very funny to me because she was so smart and everyone thought she would be like a scientist. But life isn't like that, you know what I mean? Like, you may be the smartest person in the class, but maybe what you really love is to sing. You know what I mean? So like, I loved that idea for her. And then for Sasha, for her to be a psych psychiatrist yeah. just made a lot of good sense because she had all this like angst and, and issues. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course.
Oh, sorry, I have a question. Cup, cup. Okay. Uh, before I sorry for screaming sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, I yeah. Forgot, I, for, I, I forgot mute. Okay. So um, um uh, I am currently studying for a bachelor de de degree, and is there any way to prepare myself if I want to work with Disney Studio? Yes, I think that the most important thing is to get your work online. You know what I mean, your artwork. Make sure that you know whether it's Twitter or Instagram or you know even a personal website. The most important thing is that you are accessible and that people can find you. Uh, if you have all this beautiful, beautiful work and it's not available to be seen, then I feel like you're you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. I think it's really important to make sure your work is out there and so easy to see. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Of course. Okay. okay. Like from what he asked from Zoom, it's also kind of related to what I want to ask you. Do you think it was a privilege for you to study in call art? Like from what I heard, like a lot of call art students got to like work at like Pixar or with Disney, right? Like, do you think it's influenced you to work in this animation field? Like for you to study in call art, was it help? Um, it's absolutely a privilege. It was absolutely, I mean, and that's one thing that I'm very passionate about talking to students from all different places. Honestly, at the end of the day, the biggest advantage of CalArts was the contacts and the proximity to Burbank, California. You know what I mean? Like, because when you have the job fair, it's very easy for professionals to go to CalArts because it's just so close. And that's one thing that, again, I highly encourage that like in this new age of global kind of economy and interconnectedness, get your work online. I want to see more Thai artists, you know, working at Disney. I want to see more Thai stories being being told. That is one thing I got. I got sent a list of questions that were excellent. And one of them was, uh, can you say something to your Thai fans? Recording what can we look forward progress. to seeing in the future from you? And you know, you remember when I was talking about Los Angeles, it was very specific. It was our Los Angeles. I want to see uh, your Thailand. You know what I mean? I feel like, and I've seen movies made in Hollywood that take place in, in Thailand. Um, but I feel like I want to see the true, kind of the true spirit of Thailand in animation. I, I feel like, like, you know, with something like Raya, which is great because it's a fantasy world, ultimately, it, it didn't feel like Thailand to me, or it, didn't, it was a combination of like 10 different cultures. I, I want to see your stories and your Thailand on the screen. You know what I mean? That is a big, a big goal of mine. So as I work forward in the industry, I hope to, you know, get to know more Thai artists and, and lift them up if I can. Thank you. I'm going to let Addison be asked the question. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, could, uh, could you hear me? Uh, sort of. Can you, is, can he type the question? Yes, uh, could you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you Okay. Uh, I want to ask uh, one question. Uh, I want to ask one question. Uh, what do you? Sorry. I want to ask. I want to ask one question. Uh, what do you like to make decide for the animation studio program? What's? ไปทางวิทยากรนะคะแล้วก็พิมพ์คําถามไปในแชทได้มั้ยคะโอเคได้ค่ะเดี๋ยวมันกล้องใช่ไหมคะไทเปอร์โอเคโอเค okay, okay. okay. okay, now can you hear me โอเค 
Okay, I, I ask in the, in the question box. As he types, we can do another question. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, as a, we are in like digital arts, faculty and we work in 2Ds and 2Ds and we just wondering if you have any trick and trips about the study because I know that it's quite a hard work working on like storyboard and things do you have any trip to like keep us going <laughs> a trick to keep you going I mean for me it's really important when you watch a movie uh, you really like uh, talk about talk about it with your with your friends in a kind of constructive way. Uh, I would say every movie you see, every every book you read, every comic you read, just list like these three things really worked for me, and these three things didn't work for me. And I think talking about media in that way will sharpen sharpen you to creative thinking. Don't just go see a movie and say it sucked. No, 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 no. Why though? You know what I mean? Like, where did it lose you? Think more analytically about the movies you watch, and I think that will will help a lot. Like, even even like this, ten minutes into this movie, I didn't care about anyone. That's useful because now you know when you create your story. In ten minutes, I want to love this character. In the chat. <laughs> uh, Pepper Ann was an American cartoon show from the late 90s, early 2000s. I loved it. Um, uh, I think the big takeaway for me is that Pepper Ann was a very layered and complex uh, female character. Uh, and I found that really inspiring when I was a kid. Um, I, loved, uh, I loved how it was able to tackle topics um, that were kind of uh, progressive for the time too. I remember Pepper Ann's mom was divorced and that was a big deal like in the you know late 90s. Um, oh, some of these questions I cannot answer. Uh, here, let's do one more. Let's, let's do an, another question here. Come, come. Hi, Matt. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, questions, I, I actually a little bit nerdy. Uh, actually, by the way, I'm not in your field. Mm. Okay, my background is in architecture. But okay, I, I, I uh, get pretty geeky when I watch, the, um, say, when JJ right. Abraham have a, uh, what do you call it, like a, a commentary part of the DVDs. And I find it really fascinating when he keeps referring to like Spielberg and um, the predecessors, right? People that have come before, films that have come before, um, talks about Kurosawa, stuff like this. And you talked about Chekhov guns, yeah. right? So my question is, um, you know, you have all these tropes, right? Like Deus Ex Machina and all these things. Yeah. How important are these things to your, to, to the development of your story, right? I mean, you, you talk a little bit about hero's journey in mm -hmm. a way, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the art, the character art. Um, could you talk a little bit about these tropes that, that could benefit from storytelling? Um, because I feel like maybe this part is sort of lacking um, in, in maybe in Thailand, I don't know. I see. Do you mean like an education sort of on those tropes? Or, yeah. Yeah. Like, like the, the, the importance of those tropes, right? I see, I see. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, with film and with uh, animation, it's important, like you said, to know that we are coming on the back of a medium that is 100 years old. Um, and that in those 100 years of storytelling, uh, not to say everything's been done, but many, many, many stories have been tried. 
And it's important to take the learnings from those experiences into your own work. Now, tropes, I feel like these days it's used a little derogatory, like where it's like, oh, it's a trope and that's a bad thing. But that's not always the case. It's just a way of uh, communicating these big, broad ideas, uh, kind of like a shorthand. And I think that it's, it's, they're very useful to, to use in discussion, but they're not, they're not super helpful in creation uh, from, from my point of view, where I didn't create the show being like, I want to make a hero's journey. I, I always just wanted to make what felt good. And then like at the end, you're like, oh, <laughs> it's the hero's journey. You know what I mean? When you're, when you're looking at the work. But I, I do encourage, you know, people to watch a lot of films and to get familiar with that language because it is standard. Like it's, it is how a lot of people talk these days when they talk about stories, they'll always be like, ah, deus ex machina or ah, Chekhov's gun. And you just want to make sure that you're, you know what they're talking about. They could say set up payoff instead, but yeah, lots of people do because pop culture knowledge now is so thick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. These are amazing questions. Amazing. Maybe this one is not amazing question. Do you have kids? Oh, not yet. Okay. I have two kids and I want to talk with them about art, about creativity. Do you have any idea about to talk with six years old, eight years old kids, how to grow up in, in art? Thank yeah, you. I mean, that's tricky because like, uh, and I'm not a parent, so I, I can't comment, but like sometimes um, when you want something, someone to do someone that, something, they won't do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a whole, we have an expression in English, which is you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Um, and I think that the best thing to do for young, young kids is just to uh, surround them with uh, stuff you love. Uh, don't make them watch it. Like don't force, force them to watch it but like your favorite animated movie, like if it's, you know, uh, Spirited Away from Studio Ghibli, oh, the DVD is right there. You know what I mean? Like, so have these things all very available to kids for them to almost discover and find on their own. Because I remember when I went to the video store when I was younger, uh, Princess Mononoke, which is one of my favorite films, Princess Mononoke, uh, Studio Ghibli film, my mom was like, we should rent that one. But because she said that, I said, no, <laughs> let's get another one. And then like a year later, it's my favorite movie. You know what I mean? So it's a really tricky thing, but I think just to have the things that you think is wonderful around the house, that's great. That's a good start. And then if they, if they express any interest, oh, another thing, another thing. If they do a drawing, put it on the refrigerator. That kind of thing goes a long way. When I was a kid, uh, that's how I, I, I got into art. I did a drawing and, and I think my parents put it on the refrigerator and now I've got a big head and I'm very proud. You know what I mean? And, and that kind of feeds into what you like later. Um, yeah, but I don't have kids, so <laughs> I, I, I think. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the mic. Yeah, yeah, please, please, please. Uh, the mic. Uh... So as for, you know, something called as for cast dialogue script, yes, that's also sent to overseas dubbing studios for international localization. I know that the assets are outsourced to a third party, but there are usually notes for the translators from time to time for more context and accuracy in translation. We're involved in that too. And did it also help the voice actors understand the story more? So, no, unfortunately. And I wish I could be more involved with that stuff, but because the subtleties of language and localization, you can study that your whole life and it's still very difficult, I would just be, it would be, it's completely beyond me. That said, for Amphibia, uh, the voice director of the dub, Lakana, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I know. This one. Sawadika. Nice to see you. We hired her for uh, voicing characters. And, and Grandma Bun Chui. Cop. Yes, yeah. and um, yeah. it was very lovely because the dub is so wonderful. Uh, I was so happy to work directly with you. Cop. Yeah. There is a good question in the chat. It says, um, there are so many talented artists in Thailand. Yes, man, there are so many Thai webtoons and art. It's amazing. I, I always feel so proud anytime I see something is from Thailand, you know? Do you guys know Mao Bin, the like scary little cat? That's, anyway, it's Thai, I love it. Um, there are so many talented artists in Thailand, but the films and animation industry in Thailand won't grow well or successes. Sometimes the concept looks so promising, but it needs to change because of investor vision. Yeah, <laughs> yes, rough. My question is, is there have a chance that artists such as Storyboarder can work online? Yes, and don't have to be based at the location, at the film production's location. What is your opinion about Thailand's animation industry? What can we improve or develop in our community? <sighs> So it's a, it's a great question, and I have to tell you that like, because of COVID, uh, the idea of working internationally is a lot more comfortable. Disney, three years ago, wouldn't let you work from home if you even worked in the same city. You know what I mean? Like my boss, not my boss, but my, my producer, when she saw someone was not in the seat, she'd be like, where are they? Where are they? They need to be here. And it's like, why? Maybe they could at home doing, like maybe they work better at home. Now, three years later, everyone is much more flexible about this, much more flexible about this. So I think that there is a future where Thai artists can work directly with overseas. It's just about being discovered. It's about having your work online. And it's about also like, don't be afraid to, to reach out to, to it, 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 it may seem scary, but uh, please email people. You, you would be amazed who replies. And even like Twitter, I don't know what's going on with Twitter right now. I hope, I hope it stays, oh my goodness. But what I love about Twitter is that it's so global. And I've seen so many amazing artists from Thailand, from all over the place on Twitter. And it's very easy to connect. So I think that's, that's very hopeful. I'm hopeful about that. As for the industry in general, it's, it's very difficult. I was so excited, uh, Gang Glui. I, oh my God, uh, I was so excited about that film. But films are so expensive and they take so long that like to invest, it's, it's such a big risk that even in America, it's really, it's really difficult when we have this established industry to get these films made. I would say keep, keep creating uh, Thai IP. And what I mean by that is like, keep creating characters and stories and trying to get those out. I think that might be a better strategy than trying to get the movie, movie made just by itself. Start from a character point of view, create a character that everybody loves, you know, make line stickers or make a webtoon comic or whatever and, and put it out there. And I think that you'd be surprised who's interested in, in turning that into, you know, something, whether it's a YouTube short or a show or a movie or, or what have you. But it's very, very challenging. I don't know, I don't know the answer, I'm sorry. Should we do a couple more? Two, maybe, maybe two more questions? Yeah, you want? So I just guessing uh, that uh, you inspired Anne from yourself, right? So how about Marcy and Sasha? Maybe is a character from some character or real person? So the friend group Marcy and Sasha, very close to, I had a trio of friends and uh, one of us was uh, kind of bossy. One of us was uh, very sporty, but like, you know, um, easy to kind of push around. And then there's me. Uh, I, was, I was honestly more like Marcy in personality. Um, and and Bun Choi, her, her visual design is, is mostly inspired by this old picture of my grandmother uh, when she was a little girl. And it must have been from like 1930 or something. And she just had this wild, crazy hair and this like very kind of like determined look. And I, I thought, man, what a great character. But in terms of personality, I would say that I'm more like Marcy and, and my other friend is more like Anne. But again, 
that's from my life. Those relationships are, are from my life. And I think that helps you feel like, oh, wow, I think, you know, I had a relationship like that and it helps you connect to the characters. Yeah. Thank Great. you. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. Oh. Oh. We can, we can, we can do one, two, three. We'll do three. We'll do one, two, three. Um, oh, it's really nervous here. No problem. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a big fan of you. Um, I wanted to be like you in the future. So my question is, uh, how long do you work in Disney until you get a, a animation developer? So that's a great question because I worked at Disney 11 years. 11 years I've been working for Disney. And, um, you know, I worked there three years. And then Amphibia development took almost two years. And that's not good, by the way. That's not good. That's way too long. I think development should be almost one year. But it took two years for Amphibia because the studio was trying to decide which direction to go. Did they want comedy? Did they want adventure? And they, they couldn't quite decide. So I was kind of stuck in the middle and it took a long time and a lot of work and persistence to push, oh, to push Amphibia through. Um, so I would say for you, you know, yes. don't be discouraged, have persistence. It, it will take time and you will face uh, rejections um, and that's okay. I face many rejections and it's, it's really difficult, but you have to care so much and also not care at all. How? How is it possible? But you have to find these two versions of yourself and know what, when to like be this version, this version and when to be this person because you need to kind of have both to kind of stay sane. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Cool. And this is the last question about my friends asking me to asking you. <laughs> it's a little bit awkward, but uh, in the end, how Anne, Marcy, and Sasha end up with the relationship? Oh, I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and you say, and you say, Contacting a people is important to be to be something like uh, a star, a animation director, or something. Can I contacting um, contacting you? If you uh, um, and this is why I love Twitter, because like it, if you at at me on Twitter, yeah, I, that, I will I, remember. Right. I will remember you. Do you know what I mean? So like, yeah. that's a good way for me to keep contact with people but not like give my email, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I can't do that. But if you at me on Twitter and you say, I asked that question, I'll remember, and then we can follow and then, you know, no problem. Oh, yeah. Cop. And you retreat me my art once. Yeah. Ding. Ding. It must have, must have been very good. Yeah, thank you so much. Cop, cop. Uh, just do... Turn cup. Okay, last last question. That's good. So I wanted to ask you that if if it's necessary to finish master degree to pursue this field of art, or it's not that important. <laughs> So important. No, 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 no. Um, so listen, listen. Uh, uh, <laughs> so for me, I I definitely needed to finish the degree. Uh, I didn't get a master's undergrad, but many of, of my fellow students they left before finishing. But for my parents, <laughs> I had I, I had to finish. So there's there's two answers. 
yes and no. I think you need to complete what is important to you. So if it's important to have the masters, then please complete it because there is uh, personal skills and, and time management and lots of things that will be through that that you won't learn otherwise. However, I will be honest and say that many of my peers, uh, some didn't uh, even go to college. You know what I mean? Like it's, and they're very talented, geniuses, just genius uh, artists. Uh, a few of them self-taught, didn't, didn't get a degree, and they're still incredible. You know what I mean? Like storytelling and art can be kind of innate sometimes for people. So I think you, you need to do what's important for you. Thank you. Of course, of course. Okay, we would love to continue the question period, but we know you have deadlines, Top. so. <laughs> we are going to end this part of the program, but before we end the program, I would like to have a representative, student representative to say a few words for you. Okay, please. Uh, let's see the name. Sorry. Miss Vanishya Kanbanjong, please, who has a few words for you. Okay. So, but thank you so much like, for being here. I am like, I like to say I'm so lucky to like participate in this session. So, um, I am so inspired by what what are you doing and your show. So let me think like about my future too. So, um, I have learned so many things from you, such as like your inspiration. Facebook, like start storyboarding. Yeah, so thank you for your time and do really hope like you're like to bring you bring like um so okay, so so bring like uh beautiful like to talk sharing with us again. So thank you so much. So thank you. My pleasure. Okay, please give a big hand to Matt again. And thank you for your participation in this talk, and I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you very much again, Matt, and have a fit, a safe flight back to home. Thank okay. You. Thank you. We we still have ten minutes. If anyone would like to take a photo with him, please feel free to come. I know, I know, everyone. Just only. 10 minutes and then we're gonna move